Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Jonathan Safran Foer's We Are the Weather, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so appreciative of it. Today, we are excited to have with us Jonathan Safran Foer to discuss his book, We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast. Jonathan is the author of the novels, Everything is Illuminated, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and Here I Am, end of the nonfiction book, Eating Animals. His work has received numerous awards and has been translated into 36 languages. He lives in Brooklyn. Joining him in conversation is designer Stella McCartney. As part of Stella McCartney's Spring 2020 collection, Jonathan lent his words to a sustainable capsule named after We Are the Weather, featuring pieces emblazoned with statements like, we are entirely free to live differently across men's and women's ready to wear, knitwear and accessories. Stella McCartney was born in London to a family of creators who were legendary in public but ordinary at home. Raised in both the city and the English countryside, she was kept grounded by her late mother and muse Linda, a photographer, vegetarian, and animal rights activist, whose values and innate appreciation for beauty continue to inspire her today. In 2001, the designer launched a luxury lifestyle brand under her name. Stella's approach to design emphasizes sharp tailoring, natural confidence, and an effortless attitude. The brand is committed to being an ethical and modern company, believing it is responsible for the resources it uses and the impact it has on the environment. As a lifelong vegetarian, Stella never uses any leather, fur, skins, or feathers in any products for both ethical and environmental reasons, setting a standard for the use of alternative materials. Supporting circularity, the brand is embracing new business models that will transform how clothes are produced, sold, shared, repaired, and reused, promoting long-lasting products with extended use to reduce the environmental impact. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jonathan and Stella to the stage. <laughs> I, I, mine was really long, my bit. I do apologize. Was that <laughs> it, I noticed that as well. I know that was completely unbalanced. This is it's, the Jonathan well, show. We're, we're unba unba unbalanced personalities. I'm still already making it about me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you for Jonathan. How's Brooklyn? Oh, it's a complicated question. Um, Brooklyn is, you know, I was thinking about this just before we began. How um, how much like low level anxiety there is and the toll that it takes, you know, have you ever seen pictures of when astronauts come back from being at the international space station or just from being in space for a long time Yeah. and yeah. because they haven't had any gravity to work against their, um, muscles atrophy and they're unable even to walk like from the spaceship to the, uh, bus or whatever. And so they have to be carried. And I was thinking about how, there's been like so much gravity recently for the last, I mean, for the last four years at least, but especially yeah. in the last couple of months. And I often find it hard to either recognize how stressful things are or to feel any kind of reprieve. And I'm so happy to be doing this today, both because speaking to you, to somebody that I really admire and whose head is screwed on in the right way, reminds me of what's, <laughs> possible and good and and doing it in the context of the strand which is i don't know if you if you've ever been to the strand in new yeah, york yeah you just can't leave that place without feeling a little bit better you know yeah. about, about so humanity. really in answer to the question how's brooklyn which was quite heavy sorry guys about that and there's not going to be much lightness from this chat if jonathan has his way i'll be the sort of little light humor element but so you really just want to live in the strand because then there's less gravity and you should just work in the strand in the back. I and would everything be... will be fine and dandy then. You'll have hope. Mm -hmm. 
I would probably be a happier person. You never run out of stuff to read, that's for sure. No, reading is good. Reading is is a beautiful. What were, what were some of the earliest books that you can remember reading that had like an impact on you? Well, I remember my dad reading The Phantom Tollbooth to me. I don't know if you know that book. If I, I don't even I think it's an American book. I'm not even sure. Ward Juster is the name of the author. I tried to reread it not that long ago, and it's I couldn't really get into it. It's a little, it's like a little bit of a, um, someone's going to get angry when I say this, but it's a little bit of like a poor man's Lewis Carroll, like very logically twisted and a lot yeah. of words. But that meant a lot to me. There's then, a reason that I've heard of Lewis Carroll's books and yeah. I maybe haven't heard of, <laughs> maybe yeah. it didn't hit the global stage quite as much. Not yet. But what it so, cause I know we both have um, kids and it's funny, I, getting my kids to read is like a chore in in itself. Do you have to kind of, you know, whip your children into reading or are they natural readers? How, how's that at home? Um, well, they're quite different from each other. And um, one of them is, is a, a little bit of a more natural reader than the other, but I don't really, I don't feel a lot of stress about it. I was not a natural reader. Did you make them read? Um, in not that much no to some extent yes and they read a lot for school yeah. but you know i i really came to reading late in my life yeah. that's writing. the question i guess is i i think it's really interesting when you when you find your book it's funny like you can have books all through your life in school or your parents trying to push books on you but that there's a for me there was a moment where i started like finding my books it is a bit later more sort of early teens kind of thing and what was and your book? My children will ever find their book. <laughs> I don't know. Like I had it. Well, I knew that you were going to say that. I was like, shit, I've fallen into a trap now. I think like Anna Karenina was a, one of the big books that I really fell in love with early on. For me, it was kind of like, oh, I've read a big book and I really enjoyed it. I liked um, a lot of Charles Dickens, too. Hmm. And basically, I was born in 1895. I'm just sort of, you know, I'm doing fairly well on, on time, but I'm I'm. I enjoyed those kind of older books more so than the modern ones, really, when I was younger. I think um, A Hundred Years of Solitude did that oh, for me. That really. is a great, that yeah. is one of the, it's true, I agree with you on that. What about poetry? Where's your take on poetry? Like, are you a Pablo Neruda fan? Poetry What's going on? is, is um, I would say, the bulk of what I read now. Is I it? Don't know. Yeah, I have a hard time reading novels now, and I don't know if it's because it's just a complicated thing. I mean, I don't know if you have a hard time appreciating the works of people who are doing things that are in your field. Yeah, but it's like yeah. It's emotionally complicated. It can leave you inspired, but oh, it can also God, you just yeah. feel bad about yourself. So when you read contemporary work, your head just explodes from every angle. You're like, you take it as a sort of, you know, you look at it as your industry, you look at it as you, you compare it, you, you then you try and read it without any kind of preconceived... I try. I mean, the truth is, I just don't read that much that's contemporary. Um, I don't yeah. mean that in any kind of like pretentious and annoying way. I mean, I find it um, it like it makes the job of writing harder for me. So, and, tell me about the, the. Obviously, we're here to talk about We Are the Weather, which is a brilliant book. Congratulations! That is a piece of work, I would say. Um, how do you feel about when you say you're not a, a big fan of reading contemporary work? And then I guess, you know, for me, I like, and I know, I know that it's obviously, um, you know, it's, a, it's not in the same sort of strain, but if you look at sort of Orwell's Animal Farm, or if you look at older work along the lines of trying to project some kind of concern or um, accountability to people, in how we treat our fellow creatures or how we are currently seeing our place on the planet and kind of being part of a, a solution rather than a problem. How do you, do you, how do you feel as a modern day author looking at that subject matter? Is it, do you, do you take an extra weight when you're writing things of that magnitude compared to some of your other books that aren't, you know? You know, I don't know that I, I think about them as a, as a writer, um, there's an old saying that once upon a time there was a, a person whose life was so good there's no story to tell about it. 
And I find that I always end up writing about things that feel like problems for me. Um, and I don't actually mean like the treatment of animals is a problem or the climate change is a problem. I obviously mean that as well. But what I really mean is my own response to those things is a problem. You know, I became a vegetarian when I was nine because I had a babysitter who said to me, um, she wasn't eating chicken that my older brother and I were eating. Yeah. And she said, I don't want to hurt animals unnecessarily. Mm. And to a nine year old, I just couldn't think of any refutation. It just made perfect sense. Like yeah. who would, who on earth yeah. would want to hurt an animal unnecessarily. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, it's actually continued to make sense to me what she said, but also life became more complicated. Um, and that sounds like a very kind of weak statement. Oh, life got complicated. Um, and I find that it feels good to sort of pretend that things, to pretend that we're capable of just being the, the person that we want to be. Um, yeah. I have found it very, very difficult. So, um, how were your parents when you went vegetarian that early? Did they understand that concept or did they struggle? I mean, I too was brought up, of, I was pretty much brought up as vegetarian with exactly that kindness con concept. And that for me is if it's the last reason that anyone does anything anymore. It was, it's always, you know, not killing animals now is about saving the planet. You know, not, I mean, look at all of the viruses we have, all of the diseases that we've gone through because of animal agriculture. Nobody is talking about that. They're all talking about, you know, it's not, it's all about the economy or it's about a vaccine or it's about the, you know, the impact on mental health or the impact on sort of, you know, borders and governments and, and sort of managing the problem. But really very few people are talking about where it actually originated. Is that something, did your parents kind of go, what are you talking about? You've got to eat meat for protein and you know, you're a crazy kid or did they understand? They didn't, they didn't give me a hard time. And it may simply, it may be because they were, you know, enlightened parents or maybe it's because they knew that giving me a hard time would only reinforce my stubbornness, which was probably how they saw it at the time. And some of it yeah. was stubbornness at the time. I think that you're, you're absolutely right that animal welfare has become sort of the last thing we talk about when we talk about why one ought to eat less meat. But I still think, I really do believe it's the most universal value and that yeah. even the last thing we talk about is the first thing we agree on. And I don't even mean in terms of food. I just think, you know, 96% of Americans say that animals deserve legal protection from cruelty. Yeah, my mom used to say that. My mom said animals need lawyers. So true. They have no voice. They have nobody to stick up for them. I mean, in my industry, I don't know if you just saw they culled, which is like, is culled not the same as killed? I don't understand how that word got kind of slightly softened. Um, 50 million mink in a fur farm in, in um, Berlin, I think, in Germany, because they, they, they got COVID or they, and, you know, everyone was scared that they'd pass it on to humans. And it's like, I can't, I can't even believe that's still happening. 50 million, 50 million minks. And it's like, that's not, doesn't even scratch the surface. But nobody's talking about the fact that they're killing these animals for blankets and coats and trims on gloves and like for pom poms, for nothing, for no reason. It's do you really think there's a karmic? Do you, do you believe in karma? Do you believe in a kind of spiritual ripple? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I think that. I th here's what I believe, and maybe this is what you're you're calling karma. I think we pay a price for not for pretending that we don't see things, or pretending that we yeah. don't hear things, or for ignoring the fact that we're repressing. You can't see these things, own. Jonathan. You can't see these things, and you can't hear these things because they're all hidden away. It's like the arms industry. It's probably the, the second most stealth industry on our planet. It's so shameful. People don't want to show, I mean, where are all these animals getting killed? Is any, and we're not allowed to go in. I always say to people, show, you know, if fur is okay or if this is all fine and acceptable, then can I come in and have a look at you doing it? And I, how do you feel about human welfare within, you know, the only other way I think you can connect to people on this where they're less kind of defensive and, and, and shocked at the, the 
the kind of concept of caring for animals and their lives is the 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 human like the job factor i'm always like okay it's fine if you don't if you can't figure out the animal's life i get it but what about the people that have to do that for a living so surely that's not a nice job i mean i suspect that the average person cares more about animals than they care about other people um, yeah, maybe. again i mean look the meat industry is famously dangerous um i think it's still the most dangerous industry in america um during covid all these meat plants um wanted to shut down um, yeah. because they had become these covid hotspots because you know people are being asked to work in incredibly unsafe conditions and really high concentrations and trump um obligated them to get back yeah. to work because he called they me. Got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think the problem is, and and this is like something I've wrestled with, really since I was a kid and first started thinking about this stuff, is how do you talk about it in a way that will make people want to be involved rather than want to turn away? Like, yeah, the very very same information can be conveyed or shared in such different ways. Yeah, uh, I think, and I, I really believe this, that you won't find somebody, a sane person, who is indifferent to animals. They just, they just don't exist. Yeah. And it has nothing because to do we with are animals. Yeah, because we were, I think we were born, it's like evolutionary. Like there's yeah. nobody who's indifferent to a dog suffering. Um, and then, so how do we extend that very natural instinct to care about other animals. And I, I think we have to have a lot of sympathy for the fact that it's hard to do that. Like do I have that in your in your writing, we are the weather. Do you feel like you because I, I agree and I think that's a leftover kind of sentiment of people that have been vegetarians or animal kind of aware from an early age, you know, and I think that when we were younger, I don't know if it was the same for you, but if I'd go to a dinner party and I'd have a plate of grilled vegetables because, you know, as punishment for being a vegetarian and the person next to me would be like, what are you eating? Why are you eating that? And I said, I'm a vegetarian. And they'd like be angry at me and I'd have to justify my choices and I'd have to kind of make excuses and be a little apologetic, and wrap it up in humor a lot of the time. So it was digestible for them because I think guilt, I guess, is like the main thing I came to. Do you think that um You you went that, fuzzy actually? Oh. Did I go fuzzy physically or I just sounded fuzzy or both? Have I gone I can't you your connection has gotten weird. I haven't been able to hear the last little bit. How's I that? I can't hear you. I'm well, that I'm works not perfectly. <laughs> that works perfectly. I think you're back. I, I, I lost you at uh, you're eating the vegetables. The person next to you gets angry. Oh, so I think that what you're saying is is um, this idea of of coming at this conversation in a lighthearted way, in a digestible way, in order for people to welcome it and to try and make positive changes for the for themselves, for the planet. And I think that's something that. I think that's a really interesting point because I think our generation or maybe our characters, if we were vegetarian younger, we had to kind of, op I, I, when I sat at a dinner table and you know, having dinner with a stranger at a, at a party or something, I would get the grilled vegetables and the person next to me would be like, what are you eating? Why are you eating that? And I'd have to almost apologize for the sort of slightly punishing food I was given. And I'd have to kind of, explain myself and justify myself and I was not it was normally meant with a little bit of kind of defensiveness or ridicule or you know all these things and I think that maybe our generation of of being animal aware was so out of the box thinking and so kind of almost like you're taking away people's rights and I think that's an, and, and it's a very kind of topical thing right now it's like do you wear a mask do you not wear a mask you know do you eat animals do you not eat animals it's almost like a, a God-given right that people have had, um, and so how do you feel? What, how do you feel about the kind of coming at it in a positive way, in a digestible way? Which I think is how I come at things. Where I just try and create a solution where that nobody's compromising on. You know, a vegan bag by me is as good as a leather bag by someone else. Like I'm determined for 
for there to be no sacrifice in that sense. How do you do that with your writing? Mm -hmm. And how much do you have to stop yourself from becoming very kind of preachy or angry? Do you find yourself when you when you were writing We Are the Weather that you you had to keep reminding yourself to be gentler in the delivery? I, I actually didn't really because who would I be to be preachy? Like I, I'm as big a hypocrite as anybody else. I'm a bigger hypocrite than most people is the truth. You know, um, I think, you know, and it's an interesting starting Why point. Why are you a bigger hypocrite than most people? Because I live in a house that's too big and I expend, and my carbon footprint is like vastly bigger than um, probably the average science denier, and I haven't oh. been a consistent eater for all of my life, and yeah. I close my eyes to a million and one things that I know are really problematic because I enjoy what yeah. I enjoy, you know? I am an asshole like everybody else. Yeah, uh, you're such an asshole. Why am I even talking to you? Because you're getting to do this. I'm going to erase your number straight away. But, <laughs> and what do you think? You think when you admit that, it makes it okay? No, I think that, I, too, then. Yeah, I think that um, I think a good starting point is why are people so pissed off? You know, like, why is it that if I give a reading about um, vegetarianism, inevitably somebody's going to stand up at the end and say, who are you to tell us this and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if I were up there talking about why we should all drink carbonated water instead of flat water, nobody's going to stand up and get pissed. Yeah. So what? why does this subject make them so angry? I think it's because, mm -hmm. I I think it's because they're good people and they know in their hearts mm -hmm. that something really serious is being talked about with very high stakes and nobody wants to be called a murderer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and and um, if they believed that animals didn't matter, then they wouldn't care about this conversation. So I think we need to start not with a kind of stubbornness or thinking that people who get angry are evil, but that people who get angry are good. Like it's a good instinct in them that's making them angry, which is this matters and I am extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. You know? how, then, what, how did that change for you region to region? I know we spoke a lot when you were on your book tour and you were doing that in different countries. and. How did you find that reaction? How was it in different places in the world? Where were you sort of pleasantly surprised? Where were you, you know, where you, where were you kind of shocked, or were you made to feel uncomfortable or not welcomed in that conversation in some areas? And yeah, I, I bet you and I are a little different in this way. That I still have. I'd be, I'm actually very curious to know if you have any of this as well. I still sometimes have a little bit of embarrassment when I talk about these things. Yeah. Like, I I, even to. in this interview, I'm like, oh, we're talking about it too long. Like people are going to make fun. Like I'm just conscious that I maybe I, and maybe it's not true. Maybe we're wrong though. I think it's baggage of just being having done this for so long. I think if you look now at kids and like the youth and the the future of this conversation, it's young people and they're in the streets and they're not afraid to talk about this and they've taken it. It's like empowering for them. It's a whole kind of new movement of. Yeah, fuck off and we don't want to do this. This is our planet. We don't, you know, we're gonna make choices. I think maybe we're a bit apologetic or embarrassed because I don't know, maybe because of, of how long we've been in this game. I think you're right. You know, on in, on American college campuses now there are more vegetarians than Catholics. So we're not talking about some kind of fringe identity. Um <laughs> It's an aspirational identity, and so many figures in popular culture are vegetarian. So it is yeah. looked at differently. I don't. I I hate being in a situation in which somebody is sharing his or her ethical accomplishments with me. I just get annoyed. I feel trapped. Um, I want to run away. Um, I want to go do bad to offset that person's good. It's a very stupid instinct, but I have it. Uh, that person. When somebody shares with me like how hard it is to be the person they want to be, yeah. you know, I find that actually really inspiring and, and accessible. Yeah. So I yeah, think I mean, I think admitting you're not perfect is a really important part of, of it all. I always kind of any conversation I. Have, 
have I was like, no, I'm not, we're not, I'm not being hopeful about the sort of future of all of this, because I think that's really critical as well, is to kind of, I, I find when people ask me that, I'm like, oh no, I'm really hopeful. I'm a half glass full, but I'm like deep inside, I'm like, oh fuck, it's like, it's, are we gonna be okay? How do you mm -hmm. feel about that? Um, am I supposed to answer that or what's happening here? Sorry to reappear uh, and interrupt the conversation. Unfortunately, we're going to have to transition to the audience Q&A now, but thank you both so much. That means with that thank means you. secret code for you are both so boring. What I'm gonna do is- um, I, just, I really do wanna say thanks again to Stella. Um, I've known Stella for, I don't know, how long? A decade, something like that? I feel and like longer. We didn't even yeah. talk about our collaboration or anything, like how we didn't get any fun stuff in there. Let's redo this. Next time. We can do this tomorrow. Next time. But um, still, you really have been, and have been a, a real inspiration for what it is to do work that you believe in, in ways that you believe in. It seems like there's a false choice that's often presented. You do the thing that moves you, that you're passionate about, that you love, or you devote yourself to a kind of advocacy. And a, a real lesson that I've learned from you is that that's a false choice. Like you make the most beautiful things you possibly can by way of the most beautiful process or a process that it's a reflection of your values. And I, I don't think I would have written the nonfiction that I've written in the ways that I have without that model, you know, writing things in ways that aren't argumentative or didactic, but this is me, I'm trying to be who I actually am, the writer that I actually am, and address the concerns that matter. So um, I really am well, grateful. I think, Jonathan, you're so sweet. Shut up, I can't handle any of that. But I do have to say back at you, the reason we met, and I'll shut up, I know we have to go to Q&A, but the reason we, I, yeah, Jonathan and I met, he sent me very kindly a copy of um, Eating Animals and put a note in it, and I was like, oh my God, I'm already in love with this guy. And then years later, I managed to finally get, um, hold of each other and we spoke on the phone immediately just seemed to have known each other for, for many many years but i think it was this idea of the written word and how much power that has and so jonathan you have to just continue to do what you do with such magic and grace and and commitment it's it's such critical work you know i get emotional when i think about the the, the way in which you write about this subject matter and for me, it's so important for somebody to have this honesty and to write it down because greenwashing is all around us. And, you know, to have honesty and, and real authenticity here is like, it's really rare. So thank you for inspiring me so much. You inspired a whole like collection that I did. That's right, so, thank you. You know, I worship you. <laughs> and with that. And on that note, we would like to open up some questions to the audience. <laughs> Hi everyone, you probably noticed a slight costume change. We are live now. That conversation was pre-recorded a bit earlier today. Was it <clears throat> was it weird seeing it played back, Jonathan? I didn't change costume for the record. Well, you are a better man than I am. You got snazzy for the evening. I dressed it down. Um, yeah, I, I, there's nothing in the world that I hate more than <laughs> watching myself talk, but, um, it was great to watch Stella talk. She's such a wise, um, person who really puts in the work. So, so uh, inspiring. Before we leap into the audience questions, that might be a good place to start. At the end of the conversation, Stella mentioned the capsule collection you had collaborated on. Would you be able to talk a bit about it? Yeah, so the the truth is collab, collaborate is not really the right word. Um, she invented a whole bunch of stuff um, that borrowed some lines from the book, We Are the Weather. Um, you can look at me right now and know that I'm not the guy to collaborate on a capsule collection. In fact, I don't even honestly know what capsule collection means, but um, she made some very, very beautiful things. And... Um, she has a real knack for um, offering messages without 
um, either being didactic or compromising her vision, you know, her, her vision of what looks good. And um, so she, um, she, she really did it. Coll collaboration would only be in the sense that uh, I wrote the book that she was using lines from. Okay. Well, on the uh, line about uh, didacticism, there's actually a great customer question from Facebook where Aaron says, I'm an MFA student studying fiction. I care about climate crisis and want to incorporate it into my work in a realistic fashion, but I worry about coming across as didactic. Any advice? I would worry about that too. It's a good worry to have. Um, you know, one of the things that makes fiction so joyful, both as a writer and as a reader, is that it's the rare thing, and it's increasingly rare in the culture that we're now living in and having this conversation. And it's the rare thing that's just done for its own sake. You know, it's not done for the sake of expediency. It's not done in the interest of power or money. Um, it has, in the in the in the really best sense, in the best sense, it has no obvious function. You know, incidentally. Hopefully, it will entertain people, it will make people think, it will move people emotionally. But I don't think it's a great idea to begin a novel or any work of art with an intention like that. Um, most artists I know share my experience, which is it's a bit of a mystery why you choose to make what you make. And one of the pleasures of creating is to not exactly solve that mystery, but to at least articulate the mystery of like, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm drawn to. Why, why am I interested in these things and drawn to them? What does that tell me about myself? And then readers will read that and hopefully ask the same questions. You know, what is it that I recognize in here? What is it telling me about myself that I didn't exactly know before? And in the most ideal version, a small community is created. Um, you know, James Baldwin spoke beautifully about and wrote beautifully about the power of literature to reveal to us that the things that we thought that made us most alone actually most strongly connect us to other people. They're just not always the people that you would have anticipated. Yeah, uh, I've, I've had that experience many times with writing where um, I thought that I could imagine an audience. Um, I thought I could imagine the person who might respond to what I was writing. And um, I've almost always been surprised that you know, the people that are circumstantially closest to me in their lives often don't really give a shit about what I'm doing or don't feel any connection <laughs> to it. And people who might live halfway around the world in the circumstances of their, li of their lives couldn't be more different from mine. You know, speak a different language, live on a different continent, um, aren't Jewish, aren't my age, aren't white, so on and so forth. Um, find a kind of like deep connection, and that um, is really revelatory. So I have learned, and it's been a slow lesson. It's taken me a long time not to um, try too hard in a specific direction. Uh, the directionality of a project often spoils it because it requires or is based in all kinds of assumptions about what a reader might be like. Um, and if instead I write with more intuition and trust in the value of things that are mys mysterious inside of me, I have better luck um, both sharing something real about myself and making a connection to other people. Okay. This, this is not a customer question. This is uh, my question. So I'm curious that on a technique level, when sort of approaching a novel or a nonfiction or a book of nonfiction essays, do you outline it or do you allow some of that like articulation uh, to take over? So in, in this way, fiction and nonfiction are really quite different. Fiction, I never outline it um, because I have no idea what I'm doing. And I don't say that I'm not like protesting too much when I say that or being silly. I really mean it. I, I don't know what it is that I'm working on. 
And, um, you know, uh, the poet W.H. Auden said, I look at what I write so that I can see what I think. And that's my experience with fiction. I don't know what it is that I have to share. It's not that I've discovered a voice and now just want to let it loose. I don't have characters who are living inside of me and I want to, you know, put them on a page. I really, I start with almost nothing. And it's in the process of writing that I begin to assemble um, not only the like material of the book, but a, a kind of understanding of what it is that I care about in the first place. Nonfiction is really different because I know what I'm writing. You know, it's not as if I sat down and thought, eh, I'm gonna write a nonfiction book, let's see what happens. And I write it and lo and behold, it's about animal agriculture or it's about climate change. Mm -hmm. I very much set out to write books on those subjects. And so at no point was I surprised by, by the content of my book. But um, even still, I found myself surprised by the sort of path that my thinking took. Um, with both of those books, I wanted to write um, both, um, you know, in a way that was informed by science and informed by objective reality and truth but also as as filtered through like a highly personal lens you know which involves my own cravings my identities my inconsistencies my personal history my culture um so there's plenty of room to be surprised by that as well but it was a very it was a different kind of surprise oh. To get into your book, We Are the Weather, a little bit then. So on Facebook, Aaron, or sorry, Ellen asks, the second section of your book, How to Prevent the Greatest Dying, is just rough. It's it's just a litany of dark facts. Did writing that section overwhelm you at all? And I'd be curious uh, if you I mean, the book, the book, it Yeah. Yeah, the, the book isn't rough. Reality is rough. Um, you know, the situation that we find ourselves in is rough. The climate crisis is rough. And it's one of the risks of talking about it. And it's one of the reasons so many of us, myself included, go to lengths not to think about it. It's just unpleasant. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine anything that's scarier, um, any problem that is more vast and more urgent. And so, you know, there were a lot of things that were difficult about writing We Are the Weather. Far and away, the most difficult thing was to strike a balance of being both fully honest and useful, accessible. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to tell the same story, um, as I was saying with Stella. And there are a lot of ways to convey the, the um, full extent of this crisis. Um, some of those ways will freak people out and turn them off. Um, and despite the truth of that version, it's not useful. Um, I wanted to write a book that was useful. That was very important to me. It wouldn't have been enough to know that it was true. Um, it wouldn't have been enough to know that it was accurate, scientifically, journalistically. I wanted, it was a work of advocacy. You know, I wanted to change the reader and to change his or her choices and to change my own choices. You know, I didn't write the book from the starting point of having figured something out. I wrote the book from a position of feeling really lost actually in my own life. Um, being aware that the way that I lived my life was not a reflection of the values that I thought I had, and that I was certainly telling other people that I had. Um, so in a way that was a great position to be writing from because there was no risk of just scaring away a reader or accidentally condescending um, because I, I myself felt so afraid and so confused that um, I thought, sharing that fear and confusion would hopefully be accessible and relatable. Did the writing process give you sort of clarity or once the book was done, almost remove you at all from that situation, from that space of sort of fear and confusion? 
Well, it gave me more intellectual clarity. Um, I feel even more resolved now than I did when I started the book to make certain changes in my life. Um, and to be specific, you know, the four acts, uh, the four acts that we, the four choices that we make as individuals that are considered highest impact with regard to the environment are flying, driving, eating, and having kids. Um, those are the four things we need to do with moderation most quickly. Um, I am further resolved to change the way that I do those things, but there's a big difference between being resolved intellectually and actually doing them in life. And it would feel terrific to say to you, yeah, I totally changed my life and that's it. I'll never go back. The reality is I feel more certain about what I need to do, but I continue to find it very, very difficult to do. Um, sometimes I can't believe how difficult it is. You know, it, it, and I, I worry that I am an unusually weak person or an unusually hypocritical person until I talk to others and realize that they're experiencing a lot of the same stuff. You know, in America, we know what the science is. It's actually not a divisive issue and it's not even a political issue. 70% um, of Americans have said that they wanted the United States to remain in the Paris Climate Accords. And that includes a majority of Republicans. And this is not saying that a majority of Republicans accept the science of climate change. It's saying that a majority of Republicans wanted the US to enter into a pretty robust treaty, which was gonna ask a lot of us um, in terms of accommodating industry and legislation to match the science or to rise to meet the science. Um, so in America, you know, we know what's going on. And certainly anybody who's here tonight knows what's going on. Um, we just need to figure out a way to move that, to, to con convert the knowledge into action, into our daily choices. That actually leads us perfectly into our next question, which is, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this, or your name incorrectly, from Mari, who says, you seem to suggest that individuals all making the choice to combat climate change will create a cumulative effect, a sort of sea change. Do you see that sea change coming? And uh, this is, for some reason, the questions you all are asking are slightly dark themes. But a sort of sea change, do you see it coming? And has our global response to COVID affected your hopefulness? Uh, a sea change is coming. It's going to happen. Every single arrow is pointing in that direction, whether it's, you know, the statistic that I mentioned earlier with Stella about the... Vegetarians um, and Catholics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or you can just notice it in media and in culture, you know. And the way the conversations had, it just feels so different now than it did even a couple of years ago. The question is, will it come quickly enough? Um, you know, I should, I should say this sea change of individual action, of accumulated individual action, we can't save the planet without it, but it alone will not be enough to save the planet. We also need systemic change and legislated change. Um, we, live right now in a world in which at the, at the very least for the last four years and in all fairness for the last 12 years um, and 16 and 20 and 24 and 28 um, we've lived without leaders who take climate change sufficiently seriously um, so you know maybe things will change um, with the next administration or maybe they won't in the meantime what do we do um, and the changes that we make as individuals are important not only because of their very real impact on our climate footprint multiplied, carbon footprint, excuse me, and then multiplied by the millions and hopefully billions of people who change their habits, but those individual changes also push the culture and push corporations to behave differently. So, you know, Tesla is the most successful automobile manufacturer in American history. And the government didn't legislate them into being. And I, I have my doubts about the beneficence of Elon Musk. It's consumers wanted to make choices that were more ecologically responsible. 
And so a corporation met that consumer demand. It's the same thing with Beyond Meat, which had one of the most successful IPOs in the last 10 years in the American stock market. And it was not legislated into being, but individuals wanted it. So we shouldn't underestimate our power. As for whether COVID gives me hope or not, it doesn't especially. I mean, it's proven that we're capable of making really profound changes really quickly. I, I don't know that I would have believed that cities and states and countries could close down their economies um, in response to a threat like this. I didn't. I don't know that I would have believed that individuals would change their lives as dramatically as we've proven we're capable of doing. But I worry or I suspect that we're making these changes because we fear for ourselves. You know, we don't want to die of COVID. And so we wear masks. We don't want to die of COVID. And so we accept quarantining or we accept the closing down of our economies. Um, climate change is not like that. You know, nobody watching this is likely to die of climate change. It's extraordinarily unlikely. Um, there are people who are dying of climate change right now. They're just not here, yeah. not in the United States. Or, I mean, I should say there are people dying of climate change in the United States, but it's not something that um, we as New Yorkers, for example, um, have. there's no imminent danger. So what is required of us is a leap of empathy, either to care about people halfway around the world who are suffering the effects of climate change most profoundly, or a leap of empathy into the future, you know, for those who will come after us, um, who will suffer it much more broadly. Um, you know, if Anthony Fauci came on TV um, and said, we all need to, we need to close down restaurants, we need to stop gathering um, in groups, um, otherwise people in Bangladesh are going to get COVID, it's extremely hard to imagine that we would do that. If Anthony Fauci came on TV and said, just wash your hands once a day, really, really thoroughly. Otherwise, people in Bangladesh are going to die of COVID. I'm not so sure we would even wash our hands. I don't think it's because we're evil, but those leaps of empathy are really difficult to make. And we shouldn't underestimate how difficult they are to make. And rather than assuming that we are at some point going to achieve a kind of enlightenment that turns us into people who suddenly care deeply about others. <laughs> we need to find ways to just change our norms, to change behavioral standards. Um, it would be great if a government would l legislate those changes, but um, until then we need to, as individuals, find a way to change and find ways to change our norms. So, um, it's why in the book I propose just setting up some simple rules for oneself. Uh, like I will not eat meat at breakfast. You know, don't make it a, an internal debate every time you're looking at what to order at a restaurant or what to shovel into your cart at a supermarket. Yeah. Form yourself into somebody who just doesn't do that. In 2020, I made an agreement with myself that I wouldn't fly um, for vacation in 2020. As it turned out, that was very easy. Um, but, you know, if I hadn't done that, I know what would have happened. I would have been informed by science and I would have made, with the best of intentions, I would have made a statement about how I'm going to try to fly less. And then spring break or summer break or winter break comes along. And I would have said, you know what, we've been stuck in New York for all these months. And you know what, I really want to show my kids what South America is like, and on top of which, it's ethically good to experience other parts of the world and to recognize that our way of doing things is just one tiny little sliver of the possible ways of doing things. So screw it, let's just fly this one time and then next time we'll, we'll take it more seriously. I know myself, that's what, that's what I would do. But if instead I establish a kind of plan or a rule, I'm just not going to fly for vacations in 2020, then come spring break, summer break, winter break, break. I don't have to ha go through that process. Yeah. I don't have to have that conversation with myself and also ultimately betray my own values because I will, in that version, I will just be somebody who doesn't do it. Um, it's a little bit, an analogy I often think of is shoplifting. You know, when I go into the Strand, for example, there are often many, many books that I would like to buy. Why don't I just put them in my little tote bag? 
you know maybe it's because you have that guy who stands at the door who, who checks your bag but it's actually not why maybe it's why I, maybe it's because i have a memory of the social contract maybe it's because in my heart i know that it's a difficult time for bookstores and i don't want i have strong feelings about wanting to support them the truth is it's none of those things i don't steal just because i don't steal yeah i'm just i'm just not somebody who steals so we need to shape ourselves into people who just don't steal from the planet and who just don't steal from the future. And rather than depending on these big thoughts and big feelings, we just have to find a way to shape ourselves into people who we don't even consider it. It's just not what we do. And then uh, one last question, and then we're going to move it to a slightly lighter direction. And for people watching on Crowdcast, ask more questions. Facebook is eclipsing you. Ah, in the last section of the book, you write to your children and tell them the story of your grandmother who fled Poland. Why did you put those two thoughts together? And then I think to key people, the last section is with regards to climate change in a letter to your... Yeah. Okay, so we're obviously not quite at the light material yet that you promised. <laughs> After yeah. this one. So my grandmother survived the Holocaust and died last year. Um, why did I include it? I included it because I wanted to write a personal book. You know, as I was saying earlier, I'm not a scientist and I didn't want to pretend to be one. I'm not a journalist and I didn't want to pretend to be one. Um, I'm somebody who has been very disappointed with his own response to climate change. And... Um, it's, it's just bothered me. It's weighed on me. It's made me uncomfortable. It's made me embarrassed. It's made me ashamed. Um, and I wanted to try to unspool that a little bit and try to change. Um, I'm also a writer. So, you know, writing is a, is a good way for me to unspool things and for me to change myself. And I suspected that there are other people who were feeling a similar kind of mix of emotions. Um, with respect to this issue. So once I decided that I was going to write, not as a scientist, not as a journalist, but as an individual, as a person in this moment, I chose to allow in, you know, what was going on in my life and not to try to conceal my perspective. You know, it's, when you watch, I'm sure you were watching election coverage on the news and watching these journalists like try and fail to conceal their perspectives. It's really funny when they announced the Biden victory um how what an impossible task it was for them not to like clap their hands and hoot um, Smile and leave. yeah so um i mean i don't know if wolf blitzer is experiences human emotions but the rest of them were were very excited um i just decided not to pretend and and just to write it as as a person write it as i was and so once i was going to do that then it was, I saw no reason not to include all of the things that were influencing me in the period of time that I was writing the book and thinking about these things. And it happened to coincide with the death of my grandmother. So I was thinking a lot about my grandmother, thinking a lot about her journey, her survival choices that she made. Um, when armed with the same information that everybody else had, she made some very different choices. And um, this book, more than anything, is about the choices we make in response to what we know and why knowledge itself isn't always motivating. Um, so, um, so that was why. All right. And now onto some of the lighter questions. So from Wayne Barber on Facebook, we have, how do you choose what editor you work with for your books? So I've worked with the same editor for pretty much everything I've ever written. Um, he was, his name is Eric, and he was my editor for Everything is Illuminated. And the only time that we didn't work together, it was just because he moved publishing houses and it was one of those things, but then I followed him to where, where he is now. So I've been very, very lucky um, for 20 years. Is that how long? Yeah, 20 years. I've had the same editor and um, uh, I hope he's watching this because I'm saying something nice about him right now. Yes. And if he's not, it's time for a new editor. Right. Now, when you used <laughs> was, I was afraid we had wandered back into like the dark questions. No, no, no. 
If he look, if he had died, I would have included him in my book. But uh, yeah, he's alive okay. and well. Well, um, another question is from Ivan, who says, "I've been a vegan for twenty five years and have faced various critiques, but lately I've been told that veganism is a quote." first world privilege. What are your thoughts on this critique? Um, well, first of all, we should acknowledge that there are people in the world who are malnourished and whose only access to nutrition is animal agriculture. And there are certain places in the world where animal agriculture is the only available agriculture. Um, we should also acknowledge that those places are exceedingly rare and radically outnumbered by people who live with access to different kinds of food and different choices. Um, the elitist argument against vegetarianism, veganism, or even the conversation about meat is kind of the only surviving argument in the United States. Um, and it's brought to us by the meat lobby and it's very, very easy to dismantle. Um, Harvard Medical School did a study in 2019 that found that it's about $750 a year cheaper to eat as a vegetarian than as a meat eater. People who make less than $35,000 a year are more than three times as likely to be vegetarian as people who make more than $75,000 a year. And people of color are disproportionately vegetarian. So to argue that a way of eating that is undeniably better for the planet, undeniably better for human health, undeniably less expensive, um, and is practiced by more people with lower incomes and people of color, that to argue that that's elitist strikes me as um, backward and um, really manipulative and insidious. Um, we don't need to think of these choices as identities. I think even the terms vegan and vegetarian um, risk doing a disservice to this conversation. At the heart of the conversation is a desire to reduce the amount of destruction and violence in the world. That is not a partisan issue. That is not a, an issue that depends on your age, your race, your religion, your lack of religion, where you live. That, those are universal human values. Um, in terms of our daily choices, nothing contributes to the destruction and violence in the world as much as our eating choices. The less meat we eat, the less destruction and violence we're participating in. That does not mean that everybody has to become a vegetarian or vegan. It means that we need to acknowledge that reality and do our best to respond to it, um, to eat with moderation. In 2018, uh, the most comprehensive analysis of the relationship between animal agriculture and the environment was published in Nature magazine. And the authors studied food systems all over the planet and found that indeed in places where animal agriculture is the only source of nutrition, pe those people can afford to eat a little bit more meat and dairy. For citizens of Europe, the UK and the United States, where we have access to many different kinds of food. Um, we need to eat about 90% less meat and about 60% less dairy in order to avoid what the authors called irreversible climate collapse. Now, does that mean that somebody who lives in an urban food desert is equally responsible for change? Obviously not. You know, somebody like me who can walk down the streets of Brooklyn and find anything in the world to eat and has the, you know, I would say who has the means to, to buy any kind of meal, but you know, as with that um, study I cited by Harvard Medical School, it's actually cheaper to eat as a vegetarian. I have a great responsibility to change. Um, we have to be humble when we have this conversation and we have to acknowledge and appreciate that different people have different abilities to change. Some of that might be because of where you live. Some of it might be because of your personal history, because of your culture, because of your cravings. Um, if I say to somebody, I know that air travel is terrible for the environment, and yet 
if I'm being honest, I would find it very, very difficult to stop flying. I would even say I would find it impossible. There are a lot of people in this country who would say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Like, what's wrong with you? There are a lot of people in this country who never get on airplanes. I am asking them to respect me when I say that this is a hard one for me. And I will respect them if they say, uh, yeah, I acknowledge the science of uh, animal agriculture and its relationship to the uh, to climate change, but I've been eating meat my whole life. You know, it's deeply embedded in my culture, in my psychology, in my cravings, in my emotional life. So I can't give it up completely, but I could probably give it up on the weekends, or I could probably give it up once a week, or I could probably give it up just for lunches, you know, seven days a week. I, I really respect that person. Um, I think that if we are being honest about what our own limits are and we're struggling to live at our limits, that deserves um, celebration rather than accusations of hypocrisy or not doing enough. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. So uh, let's see. What? So you've said you would like people to consider, to find your book useful, but what are some resources you can share with them in addition to your book, which I'm dropping the link of in the chat as we speak, but uh, what are some resources you would direct people to who are looking to just have more knowledge, more knowledge they can act upon? Well, the good thing about this conversation is that there's a huge amount of information that's readily available. It's, you know, from anybody's laptop or phone, they can get a pretty clear picture of um, what we can do as individuals in this moment of climate crisis. But I think that, you know, just to return in a way to the beginning of our conversation, the problem isn't information. The problem is making that information useful to our hearts. Um, I know so many people. Um, I would even go as far as saying just about everybody I know, again, including myself, who know what's right, who talk about what's right, and yet find it really tricky to remember it when making daily choices. Um, so, you know, I hope that my book is useful in that way, in making some suggestions as to how to bring our knowledge into our, into our daily choices. Um, the last reading I did before COVID, and the last in-person reading I did, um, ended with a question and answer session just like this. And the last question of that last reading was asked by a young uh, woman. She was maybe eight or nine, very young girl and um, she asked me if I thought that we would solve the problem of climate change in time and I told her my truth which is I don't know I, I, I don't know I hope so but I don't know and um, I uh, she then asked me uh, what would we have to do in order to solve it in time and I returned the question to her because I was more curious to hear what she would say than what I would say. And she said, um, I think that we would have to talk about it all the time. And I think that's the wisest thing I've ever heard anybody say about this crisis. Um, and that to me is the ultimate resource. It's not my book or anybody else's. It's not a documentary. Um, it's conversation that is constantly being had in classrooms, in cultural contexts like this one, um, around family dinner tables, with friends, and most importantly, within oneself, you know, to until we become the kind of people who just don't steal from the planet, until we've achieved that state of no longer needing to have this constant conversation, we need to have the constant conversation. Um, so, um, you know, that might sound like a non-answer, but it's the one I, I believe in, um, that um, we need to keep the subject alive within ourselves. 
It's a beautiful point. I, I just want to say before we finish up, I want to thank you and thank the Strand. Um, the Strand is one of uh, the true gifts of New York City. Um, it is every single bit as important as the Met and as MoMA and as Lincoln Center. And um, like those other cultural institutions, um, we need to support it, especially now. It's very, very easy always to buy your books online um, from the places that we all know about, but it is far more important for um, our city and our culture to buy them from uh, independent bookstores. And um, it, if it's hard to imagine, you know, we've all voted now, and uh, now that we have all voted, it's hard to imagine a more important civic act than um, supporting institutions like the Strand. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We really appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for just a marvelous conversation. I, I really did find it elucidating. It was impressive how you made just what you were saying, the sort of conversational aspect when talking about issues like climate change easier to like somehow the conversation about like choices and personal responsibility and doing what you can is a very powerful message it resonated so truly thank you thank you and uh, for everyone watching thank you so much for joining us tonight if you haven't picked up a copy of the book the link is in the chat if you're watching on crowdcast if you're watching via facebook it's going to be in the event description and on that note have a good night everyone once again, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wear a mask. Yes, wear a mask. <laughs>